game design uh, tips on how to keep your team from screwing up the stuff that you build, um, which will hopefully be helpful. So I'll jump into that for, it took me about half an hour, and then I, uh, I want to kind of run through it quickly. I normally, this takes about an hour, but I'll kind of go through it uh, relatively quickly because I want to save time for you guys to do Q&A. When we do q and i um, happy to touch on industry, Unreal Engine, Epic. Um, the one thing I'm not going to be talking about is Fortnite. So I don't want to talk about that. I'm not on the Fortnite team. Um, uh, but first off, who am I? So my name is Christian Allen. Oh, and I want to encourage you. This is my Twitter handle, at Sereland. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter. If you want to say uh, great things about how well I'm doing at this talk and take pictures of me and send it up, that's like my boss is in North Carolina and follows me on Twitter. So that uh, helps me look like I'm actually doing something instead of saying like, oh, yeah, I'm going to Seattle to talk to people. Yeah, definitely that's what I'm doing today. Uh, so the first thing uh, is about my background. So I've been in the games industry. Uh, I started as a modder in the late 90s. Um, after I got out of the military, I was a modder. I started modding for the Rainbow Six series. Um, turned that into a job at Red Storm Entertainment, which was uh, well, uh, just recently, uh, at the time, purchased by Ubisoft. So I was a uh, designer on the Tom Clancy's Ghost Recon franchise. Uh, Worked my way from assistant designer to creative director. Started on uh, Ghost Recon Island Thunder. A little bit of work on one of the Rainbow Sixes, but mainly Ghost Recon Island Thunder through Gra 2 and Future Soldier, uh, focusing on the Xbox development. Uh, and then I was uh, moved over to Bungie, where I was lead designer on Halo Reach, uh, and that did pretty good. Uh, and then I moved on to Warner Brothers. I was at Warner Brothers here in Seattle uh, right after they picked up Midway and several studios, uh, Monolith, Surreal. Monolith, Surreal, and Snowblind here in Seattle. Um, started on the Mad Max project. Um, uh, worked on that. Uh, ended up working on the publishing side for that. Uh, and did some other things with the Midway acquisition and some of the intellectual properties there. Uh, and then ended up working on the Lord of the Rings franchise. Uh, and um, so did that. And then after I left Warner Brothers, I actually started my own studio. So uh, ran a uh, Kickstarter that was successful. Uh, spun up a studio. We peaked out at about 20 folks. Um, and uh, uh, after our Kickstarter, I uh, found a publisher for our game, Takedown. We shipped that in 2013 on PC and Xbox. Um, and then after that, I shipped uh, uh, two titles, uh, Epsilon on Steam Early Access, and then an experimental game called Hotel Blind, uh, which was an experience of being a blind person in VR, um, which was tremendously successful. Um, uh, no, it wasn't really. Uh, and then along those lines, I've done a lot of consulting. I've worked with Hidden Path here in Seattle. I worked with uh, Will Smith's production company, Overbrook uh, Entertainment, on the After Earth franchise, which uh, did, is doing doing great. You know, after the movie came out, it's really well received. It's going to be a huge sci-fi franchise <laughs> at some point. That's gonna that was that's my big Hollywood break. I, I worked on a big movie with Jaden Smith in it. So <laughs> awesome. Um, and then recently I moved over to uh, Epic. I started in October and I'm the Unreal Evan Engine Evangelist for North America. Uh, so we have uh, multiple evangelists around the world. We uh, have one specializing in Europe, uh, one for New Zealand and, uh, and Australia. Um, and we actually have two in South America, one specializing on Brazil and one for the rest of uh, Latin America. And then we have uh, some community focused groups in uh, the different regions in Asia. And what I do as an evangelist is the first thing I usually do is answer the question of what do you do as an evangelist. Um, that's about 30% of my time, uh, especially with other Epic employees that go like, what exactly do you do here? Um, uh, but a, a big chunk of my time is doing exactly what I'm doing right now, uh, going out and, uh, and evangelizing and speaking about the Unreal Engine, introducing people to it, uh, let, you know, helping them, giving them information. Uh, so I do a lot of that side of things. I cover a lot of uh, trade shows for Epic. I, I go there and be uh, boots on the ground to both reach out to developers and, and different business partners. Um, this year so far, I've done PAX South, Casual Connect, um, obviously GDC. Um, tomorrow, I'm flying to LA for the VRLA conference. Uh, two weeks after that, I'm keynoting, uh, or a week after that, I think I'm keynoting 
uh, the Pocket Gamer Connects in, in San Francisco, um, and then uh, E3 time comes, and that encompasses all of June. So I do a lot of that. But the other thing that I do kind of behind the scenes is I do a lot of outreach to smaller developers and indie developers using Unreal. Uh, so I, you know, talk to them quite often. I have a stable of, of developers that's all continually expanding. There's uh, four, depending on the latest numbers, there's four to five million licensees around the world. Um, and I have all of North America uh, for anybody that's basically not a big custom licensee or have a big publisher that, that falls into my wheelhouse. So um, basically uh, any downtime that I may have at any point, I spend that time reaching out to developers, talking to them. Uh, and providing either technical support, um, getting them to the right places on Answer Hub or our forums to find answer, answers for their questions, with, you know, whether they're deploying to iPhone, Xbox, PlayStation, Switch, PC, um, community support, so giving them information on how, how to get more exposure for their products or to uh, tailor messages that, that Epic can help share on our social media channels. Uh, and then also just using my industry experience and pretty extensive networking contacts in the industry to help connect developers to the different resources they may need. Um, so a, a small developer that may have just been rocking and rolling in Unreal for a couple years, their game's coming together, now they need to get voice talent for their game. They might need to get some outsourcing <coughs> help to work on maybe porting to a different platform. Uh, they may be looking for um, uh, PR uh, support, and so I can uh, connect, kind of connect the dots together to help those people out. So. Uh, so I've done pretty much everything a game designer can do in the games industry. I'm not a coder, uh, and I'm not an artist, but I've done pretty much everything else, from voice acting to voice direction to mocap to game design to creative direction to business to publishing. Uh, and so um, now I evangelize. So that's me. And uh, that took me way too long. So let's talk about what I actually came here to talk about, which is construction script. So, how many people are uh, uh, familiar with Blueprints in Unreal? Okay, a few less people. So, Blueprints, the Blueprints scripting system is basically the basic interaction that you have uh, with objects in Unreal. So, when you're not writing code, Blueprints is pretty, uh, pretty inclusive of all the different types of objects. You know, whether you're looking at uh, an animation blueprint, which may con contain all of the information to transition a character between lots of different uh, animation sets and how their skeletons react um, to basic uh, what we call just actor blueprints which can pretty much be anything in the in the uh, in the engine uh, to more complicated things uh, a lot of the UI uh, widget systems uses use very similar system to blueprint scripting uh, the audio system looks a lot like this um, so basically blueprints are basically that, that visual scripting language that, that you can use to build objects in Unreal. Um, if you're planning on uh, using Unreal or being familiar with Unreal, with it, which I hope you uh, will be, um, uh, then it is beneficial to be familiar with the Blueprint scripting system. Because basically, at some point, any system that you touch uh, in Unreal, you're going to have some kind of interaction with, with the Blueprint system. But what I want to run through quickly here is the is a subset of blueprint scripting, which is called the construction script. And <coughs> what the construction script is is a is a subset of the blueprint script uh, that specifically runs in the game editor. So what it does is when you place uh, a blueprint script in an object, uh, you can fire off of lots of different things. Basically, you can trigger events in your blueprint script based on when the object uh, spawns into the world or when certain events happen. Uh, uh, either from other blueprints, you know, if the player fires a gun, you can key off that, player inputs, um, you know, starting a match, ending a match, uh, all those various things you can key off it. But the construction script is specifically designed to run in the editor when the object is placed. And, and that's an important thing to think about is when I'm talking through this. Uh, so basically the blueprint script executes whenever the blueprint is placed uh, in, in the editor or when it's changed. So anything, anytime you touch it, anytime you move it, uh, anytime you change a value within it, it's going to run that, uh, that construction script every single time. And that's what makes them both powerful and useful specifically for an, from an organizational standpoint, which is what I'm going to jump into. Um, it runs before gameplay. So it runs it in the editor when the, the object is placed. Um, and that keys into when not to use it. You generally don't want to use the construction script for things that are dynamically spawned into the world. Uh, you use your regular blueprint event graph for that. Uh, the reason for that is because 
um, uh, the blueprint is designed to run in the editor when the object is placed. Um, also, you, you generally uh, want to keep the, the construction script relatively independent. So having the construction script reference itself rather than referencing a lot of other objects that may, that, that may be you know, required in your levels. Uh, the reason for that is um, uh, unless you're controlling how the objects are placed in, if you're relying on, say, a level designer to place the objects in, uh, you may not know uh, uh, which objects that you may be relying on actually exist in the world yet. So if you uh, build a road object actor that uh, you know, uh, constructs a road uh, that automatically is going to be built around, um, say, power pylons that, that a level designer places, and the level designer places the road object before the power pylons exist in the world, uh, the construction script's not going to reference, be able to reference any of that information because it doesn't exist yet. So, something to keep in mind. Um, so, what I've got here is uh, a just a little demonstration. Um, I like to work a lot with Unreal Marketplace content. Uh, Unreal Marketplace is content created by uh, our developer community. Uh, anything you see on the marketplace is curated by uh, Unreal uh, or by Epic. So, we we actually check out the content, make sure that it functions. Uh, make sure that whichever engine version that they say that it supports, that it actually works in. Um, and so, uh, as a you know, supporting AAA devs, I really, or I'm sorry, smaller developers and AAA developers, I really recommend uh, people check out the Unreal Marketplace. One of the things we recently done, uh, we've done is, if anybody's heard of the game Paragon, did anybody hear about that? So Paragon was is recently shut down. Uh, it was a, a MOBA uh, free to play game. Um, and uh, the cool thing that happened after it shut down is we took, uh, or we're taking, uh, all of the characters and a bunch of the uh, content from that game and releasing it free onto uh, the marketplace. Uh, there's 20 characters on there right now, as, as well as a, a, a base level, a bunch of, of, of effects, um, a bunch of announcer, VO. Um, and those are completely free to developers to use. The only restriction is that you have to use it, well, there's two restrictions. One, you have to use it in an Unreal project, so you can't rip the content out and use it in some other engine. Uh, and uh, you can't just turn around and resell it. So you can't just download the package, rename it, and sell it on our marketplace. We're not going to approve that. Um, so I, I want to say that uh, I purchased this door pack. This is a sci-fi door pack uh, that I purchased on the marketplace. I think it was around $40. Um, any critique that I talk about this, um, I'm not bagging on the person who created this content. Um, it's just very, uh, the things that I'm talking about in, from an organization standpoint are very common. I see this a lot in uh, game development, especially um, designers, uh, how they create content and blueprints. Uh, and that's taking kind of that com the common things that you'll see in content like this and using construction script to really uh, build it out into something that uh, can be a lot more consistent and uh, ideally bug-free for your development team. So I'm going to switch over to the engine. This is the, the game editor. I apologize for the little bit smaller screen, but essentially what I have here is just a, a, a level that has all the content that came with this door pack. So this door, door pack, I think it's called Sci-Fi Animated Doors, and it's exactly that. It is eight uh, animated doors. Uh, with a variant for each one uh, with a worn material set. And so they do what you would expect sci-fi animated doors to do. So you can drop them into your space and you've got sci-fi doors and they open and close. Um, you can lock them or unlock them. Uh, you can change the emissive on their, uh, the, the colors here. You've got regular versions that are nice and clean or well, pretty clean. And then you've got worn versions which are less clean. Um, and what you're seeing here is this is actually um, 16 different blueprints, base actors. So I moved them into this deprecated folder here. You can see these are the base eight different doors. So you've got uh, these different door sets that open in different ways. Uh, these are the base objects here. Uh, and then they also have another folder that has eight different folders for some reason. Uh, with each object with the worn variant. And the worn variant of each door is just a different material instance, different material set with the worn object. Now each one of these, uh, these blueprints, when I open it up, 
it looks like that. There's your uh, event graph. This is the basic uh, inter. I'll zoom it in since there's a small screen. Uh, this is your basic uh, blueprint scripting interface. And what the creator's done here is in their basic uh, script is they have everything that you need to do for the door to function. Essentially, um, you've got your uh, interact where the player overlaps a, a box around the object that opens and closes the doors. Uh, you've got a set of variables uh, that you can set that will, uh, let's see, where are they? Oh, right here uh, on the right. It's can the door open, and you can say the door can open or can't open, and whether it needs a key press. Uh, you can also change the emissive. I'll show you that in a little bit. Um, in their construction script, they have the actual setting up the, the uh, emissive values, and then they've got their actual door object here. So you've got the static, the, the um, meshes for the door, and then you've got the trigger uh, volume that actually activates the door. Now all of that functions correctly. It functions just fine. The doors open and close. They can they can do all that stuff that you need them to do. Um, uh, for each door, you can come in once the object is placed. And uh, I mentioned that emissive option. If I go over on the right here, I can choose that emissive color that's coming out of your door lights. And as a level designer, I can change that to red or yellow or green or blue, purple, whatever I want to do. Um, I can change the emissive values on that and customize it however I want. So it does everything it says it's going to do. It's got doors, they function, I can change the color, I can change whether they can open or close. Um, it's got an interface for telling you to open and close the door and that's great. Right? That's just fine. Um, the problem with how this is set up, if you just use this content as it's set up and never need to change it or touch it, you're great because you place all your doors throughout your game, you've got your eight different doors, you've got them replicated a hundred times because you have a hundred doors in your level, and you never need to touch it, it's perfect, it's great. Where you're, where you're gonna run into some problems is when you want to make a fundamental change to all of your doors. So you say, you know what, we, we put all our doors in, we're ready to go, we just, we're you know, getting down to shipping, we tested all our doors, and all our doors open too slow. So we're going to go back, we need to ink, make all our doors open 20% faster. Well, now you're going to have to go into each one of those 16 blueprints and change the door animation speed in each one of those. Okay, that's, that's a challenge. Um, if you want to change uh, the material sets, you're touching 16 different blueprints. Um, the other thing is, while the, giving the designer or whoever's placing this object this level of control to, to control those emissive values, Seems completely logical. You're like, great, we just, whoever places it, um, we're, they're going to set it to the color based on its value, and we're good to go. The problem with that is that's, again, fine when you have a two person team, three person team, five person team, ten person team, and then you've got that one person that owns the doors. The problem with that is you get up to a 20 person team, you get five different level designers, they all have doors in their levels, <laughs> and you had that meeting and you said, okay, everybody, so if the door is locked and they need to unlock it, we're going to go with yellow. Um, so we're going to change it to this color. So if it's if it's yellow, it means it's locked, and the player needs to find a key. If it's if it's broken and the door won't open, then we're going to color it red. So we're going to go with this color. All right, cool, red, everybody good. Yellow and red, awesome. Well, there's a difference obviously between that red and that red. Um, may not be as apparent on this monitor, but if you just have everybody putting their doors to be red. Um, you can get a lot of variety within what red is. You know, same with green. Is it is it is it green? Is it blue? What what's all that mean? Now, of course, you can get around this by saying, "Hey, everybody, uh, red is, uh, you know, RGB R 1.0, green 0.055889. You you can do all that. But one of my rules is that I try to make it so that nobody's uh, typing in a bunch of stuff. Um, typing, typing in stuff is, is generally bad when it comes from a quality control standpoint because everybody makes typos all the time, uh, especially these days when nobody can type uh, because of autocorrect, uh, and you will get bugs and you will get problems. So these are the things that I'm trying to uh, avoid or uh, make better with construction script. And 
Okay, first thing I did is went too far out of my menus. So let me go back in here. Uh, back to blueprints. And so you saw all 16 of these objects. So what I did using construction script is I made this blueprint. And what this blueprint is, is it contains all of the data of those eight doors with their uh, individual eight additional uh, uh, variation all into one blueprint. So all of your door objects are in the one blueprint object. So when you get to the point where you're going down the line and you want to increase the speed of all your door animations, you've got one place to do that. Uh, so you can go into your event graph. Now if you saw when I, when I opened it up, you saw uh, kind of this squiggly event graph and it kept going from here. What I've done here is basically where you see any uh, blocks with the notations on it, that's where I've edited the original blueprint script that came with it. Uh, so jumping into the construction script, what I've done is this was the original stuff that came in the it, just to set the emissive. That's still there. Um, but what I did is I implemented a bunch of values uh, or variables, I'm sorry, uh, that the, the owner of the object, the placer of the object can affect. So the first off is the door lock state. Uh, so whether that door is locked, uh, and I chose the term blocked, locked and blocked. That was kind of silly. It's probably be like locked and non-functional or something like that. Um, but uh, so when the, the placer of that object decides to put it to be a locked door, instead of choosing that of just a missive value and then going and find that other value that says don't open, uh, they just click it to be locked. And we decided that this emissive value of, of that version of yellow is going to be locked. And then if they decide that it's going to be blocked, and they click this one, and it sets the emissive value, and then sets it so that it won't open and close. The other thing that it does is that if you try to then uh, make it locked, and then go, well, I'm also going to check blocked, it actually does not allow you to check that value. Um, if you go into it and be blocked and click locked again, it unchecks the blocked. Um, one of the things I like to do in, uh, in Blueprints, open this back up again, is these kinds of simple Boolean checks that stop, uh, that stop developers from putting in bad data, because they will put in bad data. Um, they'll try to mark it uh, you know, inverted and mirrored and upside down and you know, any, anything they can accidentally check, check mark or check everything, um, they'll try to do that. So the more that you can make it foolproof, uh, the better. Uh, another example of that is with the actual doors themselves. So uh, within uh, that blueprint, uh, I mentioned earlier in the viewport of the original blueprint, you saw this same thing. So you see there's, there's some, some doors, the frame, the, the trigger box. What I actually have uh, that's hidden, uh, just because it looks super messy if you show it all, is all of the door objects from all of those doors are actually in this blueprint. So they're all, all the different static meshes uh, are there. And again, I just, they all look crazy when you layer them on top of each other. So for visual purposes, I've hidden, hidden them here. And then in the construction script, what I do is I choose, I determine the door type, and that's based on an integer entry that I'll show you in a second. I determine which door type it is. Uh, I set which meshes are appropriate. Uh, and then I also uh, destroy, and this is a little, this is a little crazy. I destroy all those uh, additional objects. Now, if I was creating this from scratch, I would I would build this more dynamically so it would actually go into an array that that has all of the available door types and just build it in. Um, uh, but one of the things that's important to know about construction scripts, uh, much like functions, that's a little bit different in blueprints is. Uh, construction scripts all run at the same time. Everything just runs through uh, without a temporal variable. So you can't use temporal variables, i.e. you can't add something to an array, affect the things in that array, and then say remove them for, from an array because that requires a temporal variable. Um, you can't use, say, a delay, like do all this, wait a second, and then do something else in a second. It, it all runs at the same time. Um, <coughs> So with that being built, now instead of having, again, all those different objects, now I have one door type, and I can come in here and I say, well, okay, I placed my door, I want door type two, 
want door type three, I want four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And then being a, a silly game developer, I also want to put in game type or door type seven, six, seven, whatever that is. Again, it resets it back to one. Um, and that's just a simple integer check is that I know I have eight number eight types of doors. If the person puts in more than number eight, then I reset it to one really simple variable. So those kind of really simple checks can save you a lot of time um, when you find out like, why is this door not being effective? Oh, someone put in door 17 on this one and we only have 16 doors. Um, and then you can affect that yourself in the blueprint script uh, as you, if you wanted to add more doors. That's the other thing that this is built for that the other concept of having 16 different blueprints and you're duplicating them and modifying them for each new one that you add. With this one, you're just coming in and saying, oh, I got a new door type. I go in, add the objects, add it into the blueprint script, and I'm good to go. Um, so I talked about the emissive. I talked about uh, the variance. Uh, and so uh, just an example on the construction script of why uh, this is, is valuable. So uh, again, this runs any time that, that it is affected. So if you can imagine, instead of doors here, we're doing uh, trees. So let's say I, I have five base type of trees uh, in my game, and I'm going to randomly uh, populate the level with those trees in whatever way. Or my Let's actually not say randomly. So my level designer goes and puts down a bunch of these different trees. And then uh, on a per level basis, I want, might want to have some environmental variable where the leaves are on the trees are all set to a certain color. Now I could again have a separate material instance or, or color values for those leaves that the level designer could click on each tree and say, okay, yellow leaves, yellow leaves, yellow leaves, yellow leaves, all through all every 1200th tree in the space. Uh, or I could just have a construction script that basically the, the, um, the, uh, the object is placed in uh, and instead of check, changing the material or changing the thing, the, the, the object or the placer could set each value to get the variety they want. They could place their yellow ones and their orange ones and their green ones. Now, where you don't want to use construction script with those trees is if you're trying to do something more, say, procedural. That you're going to have, say, an object in your level that is going to control time of day. And may, or, well, I guess time of day wouldn't change the color of your leaves. but. Uh, atmosphere, because it's in sci-fi. Uh, the atmosphere changes, so we want the level, the color of the trees to change dynamically uh, with that. You're going to want to use your regular blueprint event script for that, because if you use your construction script, there's a possibility of whatever you're using to control that atmosphere, whether it's another actor or time of day or some other variable, um, might not exist when the level designer goes and places all the trees in. And if it doesn't exist and the tree blueprint is out looking for that information, like what color should I be, and it doesn't exist for them, then it'll generally just run the default. So you'll end up with a bunch of defaults, and then that's not going to update uh, in the game live because it's only going to run uh, pre-game in the level editor. Uh, so that's where you kind of just need to know, um, you know when these things need to be modified, when they need to be changed. Um, and again, I like using construction scripts self-contained. Uh, on things and of course you can also use randomization so if I wanted to set up these doors to basically as I placed them it randomly chose one of the one of the door sets that would be really easy generate a number between one and nine set that variable set that integer variable and then it'll choose to it basically just change this variable right here and it would be completely random helps if I hit enter be completely random with based on whichever one you placed so that puts me right at 35 minutes. So that is uh, kind of the overview of using construction script uh, in, in blueprints to organize your objects. And you can see uh, how it can be used to take something that starts relatively simple, like a door. The doors, by the way, if anybody tells you doors in video games are simple, just kick them. You can come up and kick me later. Because they end up being the most complicated things uh, in, in the game. Uh, no matter how simple they are, uh, you know, once we start getting into collision with the player actor and what happens when the player closes the door on themselves and, and how does the AI move through doors and how does the doors occlude, uh, well, they get really complicated really quick. So by having things concentrated down into one blueprint actor, that can save you a lot of time and a lot of heartache 
when you go, hey, we got a new feature for our doors. Now when they open, they play this cool sparky effect. Okay, who's going to go open the, uh, update the 64 different bl door blueprints to make sure this cool sparkle effect plays? Who gets that job? Um, this organization literally took me three hours um, to do. So it's, it's not hard. Um, so uh, that is pretty much it on the technical side of things. Um, again, uh, if you want to follow me on Twitter, if you have any questions, if you want to ship games in Unreal, I'm always available. I'd love to talk to people. Um, and so with that, I'll uh, take any technical questions on the construction scripts first, and then we can go into, I'm sure, what a lot of you want to ask, which is, uh, how, why was Halo Reach the best Halo ever? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks a lot. Okay. Uh, well, stop for the Halo Reach. So, all right. So everybody take a breath. It's getting warm in here, right? All right. So um, any, any specific questions on construction scripts uh, related to this? Yes, sir. All right. Um, so blueprints and stuff. Uh, when, uh, I haven't done Unreal enough, so... Versus like coding directly, uh, how can you keep things organized with a combination of both blueprint and actual code? That's that's a great question, and, and it's one of the first questions that, that that I always get. And unfortunately, I don't. Uh, the the question was when it comes to blueprints versus code. Uh, where do I know when to do something in code, when to do something in blueprint, how to mix the two together? Um, and it is one of the most common questions, and unfortunately, there's not a good answer. It's really dependent on your project and your team. Um, now, there are some things that make sense to be in um, in blueprints. You know, in blueprints, you can have a lot of objects and a lot of variables that you can um, can constantly change. You know, arrays, things like that. Anybody in the team can jump into them. Uh, they can find them. The, the, the one key thing is that blueprints live in the content browser here. So, um, you know, if a team member is used to, um, you know, working in here on, on weapons, uh, so I'll just pop open this weapon blueprint. I'll pop open this weapon blueprint. Well, <laughs> we'll see if this weapon blueprint loads. This is a fresh install to build, so it's probably building shaders. Um, they're going to see the same interface when they come from that weapon blueprint to pretty much any other kind of actor blueprint. So instead of, say, having, you know, if you have, let's get back to the door example, you have your 30 doors. Now you could put in code that every time someone places a door, it randomly chooses one of these list of 30 door objects that you hard code in. Now the problem with that is, if someone wants to change that, they need to go into code. Um, also, depending on how you write the code, um, uh, where's my blueprint? Oh, there's my blueprint. It opened up the skeletal mesh. Uh, so this is the this is the animation graph blueprint uh, for that weapon, uh, which is very simple. Um, uh, whereas, you know, having a, say, an array live in a blueprint, anybody can get in there, the designers can, can see what's in them, they can, they can choose when things are loaded in and out. So it just really depends. One of the things to keep in mind that blueprints are a level that run above code. So anything that's in blueprint is going to take system resources, either if you're running it in real time or, you know, running it uh, during cook, uh, like in construction script. So, um, you know, I, I learned to be a, a scripter uh, when I was at Redstorm on the original Xbox. And one of the rules that we had, actually, the engineers took out our ability as, as designers and scripters to use uh, tick as an event. We, we, they took away our capability to use ticks. Um, and the reason for that is because designers love to do that. Well, I'm just going to check this every tick. And then I'm going to check this every tick. And then I'm going to check this every tick. And now all of a sudden you've got, you know, 150 tests running every single tick. Um, Blueprint allows you to do that. You should probably smack any designer that's, that's running this stuff off the tick. There's no reason that you can't use delays and seconds and all sorts of other event-driven things to run off the tick. So um, I don't know what my point there is. Just like check with someone before you use event tick. Um, really only animation, I, I think, should be doing that. Design, usually you can find other ways that are less expensive. I guess my point was going back to the reason they took that away is because we're shipping a, a PC game onto the original Xbox. 
and every single bit of performance was in, was super expensive. Every single thing mattered. So us running, me running an event check, say, you know, uh, had, are all the enemies dead? Running that on tick versus running in that a check every 0.75 seconds, that's a huge amount of computations that are going on for no reason for the player to have a difference between an instant, like, everybody's dead, or 0.75 seconds later, it going, everybody's dead. Um, so we had to be super, super efficient. And, and that's where sometimes efficiency, you know, in code, you can control your code and, and make sure how efficient it is. So I know I don't have the hard answer, but it, it really depends. It really depends on your project. So um, when I shipped the VR game, Hotel Blind, uh, I did it all in blueprints, the entire game. Uh, including live switching from PC desktop to VR and actually back if you wanted to. I don't know why I spent time supporting that, but if you wanted to like unplug your VR and continue to play the game, you could. Um, so I think I was the only one dumb enough to spend a lot of time on that. Uh, any other questions specifically on Construction Script? Nope. All right, all right. Thanks for your time on Construction Script. If you guys want to run out after that, I'll let anybody go, and otherwise I'll just run right into Q&A on uh, general stuff. All right, general Q&A, here we go. Yes, sir. Uh, what certain aspects on Halo Reach did you have influence over? Uh, well, I was the design lead, so quite a bit. Uh, you know, from uh, when I started on Halo Reach, there was five of us. Uh, so it was me, uh, Mark Lito was the creative director, I was the design lead, uh, Joe Tung was the producer, Chris Carney was the kind of level person, and um, Lee, I always mispronounce his last name, whether it's Williams or Williamson, um, was uh, kind of the cinematic story uh, person. Uh, so and when we started on Halo Reach, it was going to be Halo with no Master Chief. That was the, that's what we started with. So, um, uh, you know, I did a lot of uh, uh, working on the campaign design, the story design, um, as far as kind of the beats of what they were going to be in relation to gameplay with the story arc. Um, I did a lot of the weapon and vehicle design. Uh, I did the first prototype for the focus rifle. Uh, worked with a designer on the first prototypes on the assassination system. Um, uh, did all the vehicle names, the revenant and saber, and all that fun stuff. So. Um, Good job. Thanks. Yeah, it turned out well. I mean, Bungie, Bungie knows how to make shooters, and, and Halo Reach turned out really well. I mean, Bungie, Bungie is an awesome team to work with. So. Uh, sir? Why was Halo Reach the best Halo game? <laughs> <laughs> because we kill you as a player. Uh, by the way, spoiler alert, you die. Um, no, I, uh, I mean, I'm... I'm uh, the, the, the thing about Halo Reach is that uh, when I was pitching it, and, and, I, and hopefully it came across, you know, there was, there was a few ideas as far as the kernel of what the game was going to be. And, and one of the pitches that I always had is that Halo up until that point, one through three, was a space opera. Um, and if you relate it back, which, which I did, uh, uh, that's just how I think, to World War II movies, it really made me think, uh, Halo 1 through 3 made me think of movies like Tora 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 or the Battle of Midway where you're seeing this big camera up, these huge events, and you're seeing the admirals talking and the, the people making the decisions. And what we wanted Halo Reach to be was more Saving Private Ryan. You know, it's about these individual folks doing this battle and the sacrifices that led to, eventually, to Master Chief being able to save the human race. So. Um, I, I, I like that personalized story, and then ODS2 went on its own path to be more of a noir crime uh, type presentation, and so, um, and, and there were a lot of decisions on Halo Reach that were not easy decisions to make. I mean, if you think killing the main character is an easy decision to make, it was very hotly contested whether you would die in the end. Um, uh, there was a lot of thoughts about making it ambiguous or having you for some reason go on the ship to Master Chief and then come back for some reason and, and all sorts of different endings um, and even the t the way that you died with the, the final wave combat of, of fighting the Covenant and on and on and on until you, you die um, was was very uh, very controversial but I think uh, was uh, was important to the, the story and the presentation of you know everybody else's sacrifice and and just the core gameplay of, of you know, being more of a uh, team of soldiers or a team of, of warriors uh, rather than a, an individual 
uh, Uber Master Chief. <laughs> Not that, man, there's nothing wrong with Master Chief. He's cool. He's got a cool <laughs> voice. So uh, going back to Unreal, if you uh, have one thing, like let's say I'm teaching Unreal. Okay. In your opinion, what would be like the most essential things to first teach someone who's getting into Unreal? Well, so I, I'm a blueprint scripter by background, so that's what I'm going to lean on. That's what I'm going to go to. The, the great thing about blueprints is even just starting with the, the most basic object and the most mo generally the most important object in the game is the player pawn. Uh, the player pawn, a pawn is a type of blueprint actor. So all blueprints are actors is kind of their base thing. Uh, and then there's subsets of uh, those actors. And a pawn is an object or a, a, ca a character. It's, it's a thing that can be possessed generally by AI or the player. And the player pawn is the way that generally a, a lot of the way that the player interacts with the world. So obviously in a first person shooter or, or actually third person shooter is easier to visualize, that character that's moving around is the player pawn. Uh, that's what they are. Um, so the inputs that the player's putting into whatever controller that they have, uh, whether it be mouse and keyboard or their iPhone, uh, are going from the player into that player pawn and then reaching out to the rest of the game. So whether the player puts an input in to move over here and then the pawn moves over here that hits one of these doors. Well, that's not a door anymore. Um, <laughs> hits one of the doors and then they open. Um, and how that object, how the player pawn and how blueprints in general communicate with themselves and communicate with each other, that's one of the fundamental things using things like event dispatchers or getting objects and reading their data values. Um, once you kind of get your head around that, the way those things communicate, so when you say, I want to bring up a menu that allows the player to choose these things, well, what does that look like in Blueprints? I'm creating a menu widget that, that is created, then added to the player's camera, then, then uh, overlaid, and then that widget has a bunch of interactions that the player is clicking through, then that widget is then sending a cast out to the player pawn, grabbing its event dispatcher and saying, okay, based on whatever happened in this widget, now turn right and start shooting, um, or whatever, enable the spell or whatever. So understanding how those things communicate with each other and how that works, and starting to get a concept of, you know, there are different types of blueprints and different types of objects, and certain ones can communicate with each other. Your level blueprint is a key one where your actual world space exists in in most places, although when you get start getting into AR development, that's sort of starting to get your head wrapped around something else because the world space and the world origin point can change, uh, which is crazy time. Uh, but th that's what, just a, a basic understanding of how blueprints work uh, can, be, can be really, really valuable. And the biggest thing that I recommend that so many people don't do is, um, is to use these. These are uh, these are the blueprint uh, templates or uh, starter content uh, that you can use when you create a new project. <coughs> so you see here, you've got first person, you've got flying, you've got handheld AR, uh, you've got shooter, top down, third person, and and what those do is that it's got the blueprints pre built and uh, to that type of of game or interactive experience. So the classic is the, the first person shooter or the third person shooter. And the third person shooter, I don't know how long this will actually take to create. Um, oh, really fast. Because um, it's empty. Oh, or to crash. Yay. What are the other? <laughs> uh, yeah, we'll do that. Um, uh, generally, don't create a project with a project that's already open. Oh, it's doing it. See, it's doing it. Um, we just had to shut down the other one. Um, what was I talking about? Uh, <laughs> yeah, the templates. Uh, the most valuable thing is, 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 yes, they're great. They've already built a lot of thing. In third-person characters, you're going to have a character and a camera, and the control is all going to work and everything. But getting in there and looking at how they're constructed is really, really valuable. Like, basically, the way I learned how AR works in Unreal is I downloaded the Unreal template that came with it, and opened it up and started playing with the blueprints and getting an understanding on how, okay, now the, the engine is detection detecting the horizontal planes that the phone is generated based on its computational data and sending it back 
And now once I've got that horizontal plane data, even though it can change at any time, I can then lock it in and say, okay, now that I'm going to take that plane data and turn it into a chessboard that floats in the world, lock that in, and now I've got my pieces, I've got a floating chessboard. But if I didn't understand how that plane data communicated through the blueprints, then I would never understand how to do that. Does that yeah, answer your question? One more. One more, real well, quick. Um, so working on the other day, this, like, I constantly find that there's things that baffle me or there's things that you know you don't see a lot because they're not commonly used mm -hmm. and they're not really exposed and a lot of people don't cover them. So is there anything deep in the engine or uh, tools that are available that not a lot of people know about that you would want to recommend? Um, Well, I mean, I've done a lot of things, you know, one of the things, whether I would recommend you do it, or, <laughs> um, it the blueprint system can, can help you think a little out of the box. Like, one of the things I did on my game, uh, we had a game called Epsilon, and it was uh, three, four of us working on it for about eight months, and I wanted to do a pre-planning uh uh, section of the game, similar to like the original Rainbow Six or uh, kind of like Door Kickers. Uh, well, that's their whole game, but kind of like Door Kickers. Um, but we didn't have a U we didn't have a graphics UI artist implementer person. We had my my lead artist. She actually worked. At, she was came from Gorilla. Uh, she's super talented, super great artist, but she wasn't really into building UI. And I didn't I wasn't super experienced with widget system, the UI widget UMG at the time. So what we did is instead of building a traditional UI for the top-down map planning, is she actually built 3D representations of the level in multiple levels. Those objects were placed uh, outside in real in real space outside of the actual level, and then I took I made 3D primitive objects that were controlled by the like the objects in the world like the doors and the AI and security cameras and things that translated those 3D objects into that world space. And so when you hit the look at map button, what it was actually doing was taking control of a camera that was 80,000 world units on the y-axis away, looking down at these 3D objects that were attached to the things in the real time space. Um, that sounds overly complicated when you could just make a mini map, but we didn't know how to make a mini map. So we did it this way. And the great thing about that is it was always loaded in real time. It was always sitting out there, streamed in. So you didn't have any lag, you didn't have any things, and I could actually then use that for a pre-planning thing, so not just in real time, a pre-planning thing where you could put all these objects down and everything, all these waypoints and everything you wanted to do, and then when you hit go, it was instant. Because instead of loading the level, even though to the player they were saying load the level, all they were doing was moving their camera from over here looking at this map and teleporting over to this other camera that, that took over the player pawn and they started moving around and shooting. Uh, so, again, blueprints can be really powerful. The one thing I would, I would tell people to do is, is definitely you know, utilize the resources that are out there. Uh, we're constantly working on our documentation. We know it's not perfect. Uh, we know it's not constantly update. We, we have active... Uh, uh, stuff to do that. I may have just been roped into, someone heard about me doing a construction script presentation and they went, hey, we need more documentation on construction script. So I may be doing some of that. Um, but uh, um, also the community forums are really, really helpful. Um, there are people in there that have been using Unreal for years. They love to help people out. We have developers in there. I go in there. Um, and a lot of times people can be really helpful where you can go in, you know, I don't really understand this. I'm getting this bug or this crash, I'm going to post this, and people can come in and give a lot of, uh, a lot of help. And, and people, a lot of times, will struggle too long for something that there's an answer just waiting for you to, to be given there. Maybe one more question. Is that Christian, uh, Christian generously uh, said you spend a little more time in uh, the classrooms and looking at your amazing second year uh, game projects. So, um, yeah, Matt, why don't you ask one more question? Yeah. A good, the best question. Oh. Yeah, it's got to be the best one. It's the last one. Something that's going to help everybody in this room. Uh, what, what are some uh, common mistakes and errors or just like misunderstandings you see of people who have been using a for either a long time or a short period of time? Like, what are some like, common like, dude, come on, like, you should know better? Or, like, yeah, yeah. Common
common things. Well, the number one thing, the number one thing, and people do not do this enough, is get source control. <laughs> that, like, like first, yeah. like first. Whatever it is, if it's Perforce, it's like super easy. I'm not connected to Perforce right now, but uh, because I'm not connected to our server, but you're gonna see down here on the left, I have Perforce installed, and I'm just making these things as, uh, I don't wanna log in, because <laughs> Epic might yell at me. Um, but get your source control uh, plugged in and have it integrated with the engine. If, if, uh, if, if you can use one of the source controls that we support, I use Perforce just because I've been using it forever. Uh, I don't know if they have any kind of student deals. One, you gotta know it. If you don't learn source control, you're, you're hosed, because um, you're gonna get fired the first time you accidentally delete the depot, which I've had happen. Um, uh, Terry. Uh, uh, <laughs> well, you watch this. Um, uh, no, um, I didn't fire him. He fixed, he fixed it before anybody really figured it out. Uh, he blamed me. He was like, oh, the network's down. I was like, wait a minute. The network's up. Just the depot's gone. Uh, but uh, uh, you will eventually, you'll run into a problem where you go down the wrong path and you break something that you already worked or you change something, you, you built something and then you come back to it and you're trying to do something else and you, and you forgot what, how you did it and you break it and all you wanted to do is roll back to what you did four hours ago. And those four hours add up, especially when you just get to a point where you're like, what did I do? Like, I, I am so, have just gone down this rabbit hole, it wasn't a good idea. Well, and just the power goes out and your system crashes and Windows does its thing. Like, get source control. I, I talk to so many people that don't use source control and don't use backups. Like, have source control, get a portable drive, plug that portable drive in and just have it mirroring it every day. Or carbonate or something like that. Because there's a story that I, uh, that I like to tell because people, it, it's really, really important. So there, there's a, a, a team that was working on a game called Project Zomboid there in the UK. Has anybody heard of Zomboid? Okay, cool little game. Well, isometric. Zombie game, it's grown, you know, it started out with eight people uh, back in like 2010, 2011. Um, and originally, I think they had like three coders. They wrote the engine from the, the ground up. And the way they were doing it is they had, uh, they had a, a laptop with like two hard drives. And so on that laptop, it was duplicating the, the, the source of the game. And then they were like sharing the laptop around between the three of them. One person would work on it and it would copy over from their laptop to this laptop. So they had everything backed up on this one laptop which had a hard drive that would back up again in case it failed. That was great until someone kicked down the door of their apartment and stole all the laptops. <laughs> <laughs> right? Walked in and they're in the UK so that happens a lot. But uh, uh, there was two laptops sitting on the, on the coffee table, kicked in the door, got the laptops gone. They lost like six months worth of development work. Um, so back up, back up, back up, source control, source control, source control. Like, if anything, I don't care what engine you're using. It's not perfect. You're going to screw up. You're going to have a crash. It, it's, and it's a required skill set in the industry. Whatever you're doing, you're going to have to understand uh, source control. And not, oh, we've got a folder on the network and we all save to it. That's not source control. So. Good question. Yes. That was a good question. There you go.